The cities of Tucson, Arizona, and Nogales, on the border of Mexico, are connected by the most unique highway in the United States. It's unique for a specific reason. It's measured in kilometers. Now, granted, there are some other road signs in the U.S. that have kilometers on them, but I-19 is the only highway in the United States that's 100% metric, top to bottom, all 63 miles of it, or 102 kilometers. Now why, you may be asking, in the land of Freedom Units and Big Macs, is this one highway using the everywhere else measurements? Why such a rebel, I-19? The reason this highway exists, and uh, well, the reason I'm talking about it, is that despite all the little snips and jabs that people always throw our way because the U.S. just refuses to go metric, the truth of the matter is... <laughs> we tried, guys. Like, a lot of times. And here's why they all failed. So I've been on YouTube for a long time, guys. In fact, I'm sure that there's some people out there watching this right now that were in diapers when I started. And some of you maybe weren't in diapers when I started and are on diapers now. Because, you know, old people problems. Or maybe it's a kink, I'm not judging your journey. When I started this channel, Obama was still president. New Horizons had just been to Pluto. SpaceX hadn't even landed a Falcon 9 yet. And my beard was comically darker than it is now. I mean, good God. It doesn't even look real. Suffice it to say, the world has changed quite a bit since then. One thing that hasn't changed is the baffling vitriol whenever I use Imperial units in the comments. Like, even if I do use the metric units too, it's just, it's just seething remarks. How dare you acknowledge this exists? And look, I know it's not directed at me. I know it's about the, you know, attitude of American exceptionalism. Like, we think we're special because we're all wealthy and make all the movies and have all the bombs. I'm kidding, obviously. Um, a lot of countries have bombs. Seriously though, in our defense, um, we're also really terrible at healthcare. And gun violence. And education. There's a lot more valid criticisms of the US than the metric system thing is all I'm saying. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of reasons for not switching that have nothing whatsoever to do with American exceptionalism. Uh, for one, there's just cultural inertia. I mean, seriously, imagine what it would be like if, if you woke up one morning and all the numbers you used to measure your life suddenly changed. Like you go to the gym and the eight kilogram dumbbell you're used to is now a, a stone and a half dumbbell. And when you checked your GPS to go to another gym, you find the closest one is 16 furlongs away. Whatever the hell a furlong is. It would be chaos. Just like it was chaos when Europe switched to metric in the early 1800s. Seriously, I did a video on metric time. Um, I highly recommend you check it out because it does give kind of the whole history of the, the switch to metric and lays a lot of, you know, context for this video and whatnot. But I talk in the video about how there were literally armed rebellions against it that, like, Napoleon had to put down with his army. Yeah, you guys didn't exactly embrace it with open arms yourselves, so maybe don't be so smug about it. Also, to be fair, is that when the rest of the world switched over to metric, it was a very different time in humanity. It was, it was mostly before or at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, today with all the mass production of goods that's going on right now, to switch everything over to a new measurement system, that would be a gigantic undertaking. The U.S. switching to metric this late in the game would be by far, I mean by far, the largest, most complex transition of measurement systems in human history. And yet, we should do it. We should still do it. There are obvious benefits to switching to metric, like, you know, the simplicity of it, getting on the same standard as the rest of the world, it would reduce or eliminate conversion errors. In 2015, NASA estimated that a total conversion to the metric system would cost them $370 million. Uh, it sounds pretty bad, but uh, 16 years earlier, they lost $125 million when the Mars Climate Orbiter crashed due to a confusion over units. So yeah, one conversion error cost half the amount that all of the uh, metric conversion would have cost. And it can be argued that there's a lot of things in the American industry that suffer from the same problem. In 1996, education policy expert Richard P. Phelps wrote that 71 days of math classes per student could be saved if schools only taught the metric system. Because we do actually learn the metric system in school, but we also learn imperial units since that's what most of the stuff around us is in. He also estimated that teaching only metric instead of both would save 17 billion dollars. Besides, we do measure some things in metric, you know, our, our track and field events are measured in meters. We buy soda in two liter bottles. So soda is sold in liters, but, but milk is sold in gallons because cows have fewer toes. I don't know. 
obviously all this would be a lot simpler if we had switched early on at the very beginning. Um, and again, we tried. So to get a little history on the metric system, it's basically a French invention. Um, it was kind of a byproduct of the French Revolution, or at least it was, it was fueled by the same revolutionary fervor. And at the time, uh, the US and France were BFFs because France helped us in the Revolutionary War. Um, sadly, the, the forever part of BFF did not last forever. So the National Assembly of France commissioned what came to be known as the metric system in 1790. Thomas Jefferson was an ambassador to France at the time, and he loved the idea. Benjamin Franklin was the ambassador to France before that, and he was also a big fan. And later on, Jefferson would implement at least one type of decimal system in our country, in our currency. Yeah, it's kind of hard to believe now, but that whole hundred pennies to a dollar thing was a pretty novel idea at the time. Up to that point, we'd been using the British coinage, and it was complete nonsense. So like, it's like 12 pence equals a shilling, and then 20 shillings equals a pound. What? By the way, that was called the Carolingian system, and it wasn't dropped by the UK until 1971. So, I think we're late to the game. So yeah, Thomas Jefferson instituted basically a metric system of currency way early on. And Ben Franklin actually designed a one cent coin in 1879 called the Fugio cent. But instead of putting in God we trust on there, Ben Franklin put, mind your business. Okay then. That coin was very rude. But despite Jefferson and Franklin twisting people's arms, there wouldn't be an official system of measurement until 1832. And by then, the U.S.-France relations was kind of in the toilet, or the bidet, you might say. Um, there are many reasons why, but the short version is Napoleon. Get it? Short version? Napoleon? Which was actually uh, kind of a myth. He wasn't really that short. I talked about it in that video. Yeah, a lot of U.S. ships had been seized by the French during Napoleon's wars in Europe, which soured things. And then after Napoleon was ousted, the U.S. demanded millions of francs in damages, which never came. So, yeah, we weren't really fans of France in that particular moment. Not so fast, buddy. Petite, you ain't paid yet. Pay? Pay. Unfortunately, that particular moment was also when the Congress was voting on an official measurement system. So. They decided against the French system, because they were in an anti-France mood at the time, and just kind of went with the system that we'd already been using, basically the one that we inherited from the British. And for at least 30 years after that, metric was basically dead in the US. But it did have its advocates. Uh, one was a scientist named Alexander Bach, who loved the metric system. He spoke passionately in front of Congress about how the world was going to bypass us and we were going to fall behind if we didn't get on board with it. Alexander Bach also just happened to be the great-great-grandson of Ben Franklin. so. Uh, he was just kind of carrying on the family tradition. And for a minute there, it looked like it was going to work. Um, in 1863, Congress approved the founding of the National Academy of Sciences, and they named Alexander Bach its first president. And one of the very first jobs of the National Academy was to evaluate the measurement system. So, I mean, slam dunk, right? A committee formed by the National Academy recommended reforming the U.S. system to metric, but the chairman, a guy named Joseph Henry, um, kind of kneecapped the whole thing? In the introduction to this report, he highlighted, quote, the difficulty of adopting the best system and of introducing it in opposition to the prejudice and usages of the people. He predicted it would take time to educate the rising generation on advantages of change. Way to get people fired up about it there, bud. He also weirdly said that the metric system is, quote, not considered by many as well adopted to the Anglo-Saxon mind. God, the nice things we could have if it wasn't for the Anglo-Saxon mind. Yeah, as weird as that statement is, um, that's not the last time you're going to hear that in this video. Anyway, the result of this half-assed support was the legalization of metric in 1866. Not the adoption as a standard measurement, just the legalization. You know, surveyors could measure mountains in meters, postmen could weigh letters in grams. But they didn't have to. Nothing was compulsory in this legislation, it basically just said that people who don't like metric can't sue for it. Which sounds like a half-measure. And it was, but then again, you know, the U.S. had literally just gotten out of this. So maybe not the best time to rile people up. Again, people had rioted in the streets in Europe over this just a few decades before. And even this weak sauce law brought out opponents out of the woodwork. Academics started attacking the meter and questioning whether the human mind could grasp division into tenths. I mean, come on, if we were supposed to be using factors of 10, God would have given us 10. Oh. Okay, so at this point, we basically had two different competing systems of measurement in the U.S., and people on both sides ran heated campaigns to win over the public. 
One of the biggest debates was waged in the newspapers between the president of Columbia University, Dr. Frederick Augustus Porter Barnard, who was for the metric system, and Professor Charles Davies, also of Columbia, who was emphatically against it. Barnard was realistic about how difficult it would be to transition to metric, but he also believed that people would eventually choose the system as a social blessing. And he went all in on this. He founded and ran the American Metrological Society and an offshoot of that, the American Metric Bureau. By the way, one of the people who worked at the American Metric Bureau was a guy named Melville Dewey. Um, he uh, kind of helped organize and took care of the day-to-day -day affairs of the place, which he was uniquely qualified to do because he was a librarian. A librarian who was really interested in decimal systems. Named Dewey. He was a Dewey decimal system guy. Davies, on the other hand, argued that it would be really expensive to switch, maybe even tank the economy, but mostly he just believed that the old English measurements made more sense because they were based on the body. You know, a foot was roughly the size of a foot. An inch is roughly the length of the first digit of the thumb. And since the measurements were based on the human body and the human body was made by God, well, they're kind of holy measurements, aren't they? This was exactly the belief of a popular religious movement at the time that had grown up around the theories of an English publisher named John Taylor. In 1859, Taylor had published his book, The Great Pyramid, Why It Was Built and Who Built It. He was kind of the aliens guy of his time. He followed this up in 1864 with, and I, I swear to God, this is the full title, The Battle of the Standards, the Ancient of 4,000 Years against the Modern of the Last 50 Years, the Less Perfect of the Two. To keep from going too far off track, I'll sum it up like this. Taylor argued that the Great Pyramid's construction had been directed by God. Therefore, its dimensions could be used to figure out a divine system of measurement. Therefore, anyone who advocated a different system of measurement was conspiring against God. Among those who took up Taylor's cause was a number of wealthy, influential men who wholeheartedly believed in the superiority of Anglo-Saxon measurements. They even had a theme song that included these lyrics. They bid us change the ancient names, the seasons, and the times, and for our measures go abroad to strange and distant climes. But we'll abide by things long clear and cling to things of yore, for the Anglo-Saxon race shall rule the earth from shore to shore. Yikes. Just in case you ever wonder why they call it the imperial system. There you have it. I should be pedantic and clarify the whole Anglo-Saxon thing was racist, um, but it was mostly racist against French people. And the craziest thing is it worked. The metric system was stymied in Congress thanks in part to, you know, Anglo-Saxon supremacists. Anyway, Davis made some of these arguments in his back and forth with Bernard, which took place in the newspapers for years. Um, their opinions would then go on to shape lawmakers and the public until the end of the 19th century. Basically, anybody who opposed quoted Davies and anyone who favored metric quoted Bernard. And that's kind of where things stayed until about 1902. And that's when Congress held more hearings about metrification. You know, America was more of a melting pot than earlier. And, and so like that kind of super hyper narrow racism wasn't quite as effective as it used to be. But you know what was effective? The New York Times editorial page. The New York Times called the hearings propaganda and claimed that if metric proponents got their way, even thinking in other units would be a crime because that's reasonable. The U.S. Attorney General at the time denied this, that, you know, you could get arrested for thinking about a foot. Um, but yeah, the public outcry at that point was strong enough for Congress to surrender and they dropped the hearings. Hey, uh, future Joe here, sorry for the interruption, but I found out something after I recorded this that I felt was worth including, so uh, I'm including it real quick. So in 1902, they did drop the effort to standardize metric across the entire country, but there was a bill in that year that was going to make the federal government go strictly off of metric. And that bill failed by one vote. And metric supporters often point to that as one of the times when we really got close to actually going metric because yeah, it would have just been the federal government, but then any private company that was working on any government contracts would have to work in metric and that could have led to sort of a, a cascading effect. Anyway, thought I'd throw that in there. Back to the video. Another wave of interest came after World War I. Metric proponents again made the argument that the U.S. could be left behind if it didn't convert. Which kind of makes sense. The U.S. was kind of new on the world stage in World War I. That was the first time we were like involved in a major world conflict like that. But unfortunately for them, this was also an era of extreme nationalism in the U.S. Um, 
If American exceptionalism had a golden age, it would be in the post-World War I years. This is when America first became a thing. Another push for metric bubbled up in the late 1950s. In 1957, the US Army adopted metric units for some of its weapons, and in that same year, the Soviets put Sputnik into space. The Soviets, who had been strictly metric since 1925. So yeah, their success in space kind of got the US to think seriously about the technological consequences of staying stuck in the past. Um, also thinking about the consequences, Great Britain. In 1965, the UK got serious about metrification and they planned to convert the whole Commonwealth within 10 years. Which, you know, since the US had always followed the British and their system, it kind of made us go, maybe? So once again, a study was funded to look into the advantages and the disadvantages of doing the same as the British. This was the last time we really got serious about switching to metric, and it went very, very slowly. Congress took three years to authorize the funding for the study. After it was published in 1971, it took another four years before the Metric Conversion Act was signed into law by President Ford. Yes, a law was signed called the Metric Conversion Act by a Republican. The act created the United States Metric Board, or USMB. Their job was to oversee metrification in the United States. It's happening, guys! But the board was given no actual power. Ford left office in 1977. His successor, President Carter, moved forward with the initiative. He got his nominees for the USMB board approved, and they held some meetings and got some PSAs aired. And as a test run, they decided to make one US highway a metric highway. And that's how I-19 got its kilometer signs. Beyond that, though, the USMB kind of just limped along. Um, like I said, they didn't really have any power. Most of the country was indifferent at best, and the opponents were just as dogmatic as ever. Chuck Grassley, who is currently a senator from Iowa, was a representative from Iowa when the Metric Conversion Act was passed uh, 46 years ago. But he said at the time, quote, forcing the American people to convert to the metric system goes against our democratic principles. And in 1982, President Reagan dissolved the USMB. And since then, yeah, further attempts at metrification have been all but invisible to the American people. And we seem kind of fine with that. I mean, there, there hasn't really been a real push to switch since the 1970s. So, I mean, as much as you want to blame, you know, the powers that be for all this, when it all comes down to it, we're really not that interested. I mean, it's not often that I agree with Chuck Grassley on anything, but when he talks about democratic principles, the fact of the matter is, according to a 2016 poll, only 32% of Americans want to convert. If the majority of people in the U.S. wanted to convert, we'd do it. There's just not really any urgent reason to do it currently. I mean... What we have works for us. I've made this argument many times that the United States is actually kind of an isolated country. We only border two countries, we've got oceans on either side of us. We don't do things our own particular way to thumb our nose at anybody else. We just do it our way because we can. There's no urgent need to adopt somebody else's system. That might be slowly changing though. You know, the world's getting more connected as we all know. Companies may find that Switching to metric in their products might save them money when selling internationally. For instance, DuPont started using metric exclusively in its neoprene packaging back in 1968, and it saves an estimated $20,000 annually by not having to, you know, repack products for different markets. Of course, their annual profits are $13 billion, so not exactly a game changer, but still. And look, for the record, I am 100% in favor of switching to metric. I would do it in a heartbeat. I mean, yeah, it would be a bit of an adjustment, but I mean, you know, just adjust. <laughs> it's not that hard. I've traveled overseas. You get used to it really quickly. So if you're really passionate about switching to metric, talk about it. Talk about it a lot. Talk about it obsessively because if enough people want to do it, it will happen. So it feels to me like converting to metric is probably the best thing in the long run, uh, but it, it would require a lot of sacrifice and cost up front, which let's be honest, we're not exactly great with that kind of long-term thinking. Yeah, the U.S. would be the kid that fails the marshmallow test. And I want to say that switching over is inevitable as, again, the world is becoming more interconnected, but that's also been true for quite some time now, and we seem less interested in doing it now than ever before. So, yeah, I don't know. But I would love to hear your thoughts. Do you think that it's inevitable? If you're from the U.S., would you want to switch? Talk about it down below. God, could you imagine if Biden just announced tomorrow that he was switching the U.S. over to metric? <laughs> just imagine the newspaper headlines. Some would talk about economic implications. Some would call it anti-American. Hell, the New York Times called it propaganda 100 years ago. How those newspapers covered it would drastically change the public's perception. I mean, that's always been true, but now we've got these silos where you only hear one side of any argument. 
Maybe the key to switching over to metric and getting people on board with it is to change the media environment. On that note, there is a service I want to talk about called Ground News. Ground News, I know this sounds hyperbolic, but I honestly think that Ground News might be the future of journalism. Hear me out. So what they do is actually kind of genius. They basically aggregate articles from over 50,000 news outlets from all around the world, and then they arrange them by topic. So if you want to check out the news on a certain topic, uh, you just find the topic you're interested in. You can browse the articles on that topic, and right there where you're browsing, it tells you how biased the article is. These are rated by three independent news monitoring organizations for bias and factuality, so you can see for yourself where this information lies on the spectrum. Because, I mean, let's face it, all news sources have some kind of bias. It's kind of impossible not to, but at least with ground news, you know where they stand. And listen, you know, if you want to stay in your lane, just getting only one side of the news, that's, that's fair, that's your right, but at least you know what you're getting. Or if you want to step outside your comfort zone, see things from a different angle, you can seek out that information. Better yet, they also have something called a blind spot feed, which highlights stories that are disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum. They also have a browser extension that's really cool. You just install it on your browser, and then any article that you're reading, it'll tell you how left, right, or down the middle it is. But I really do think that this is where news media is going to need to go in the future. Um, at least I hope they do. I'm really bullish on ground news. I think it's an absolutely wonderful product and a service that we should all be getting on board with. And if you are on board with it as well, and you want to give ground news a try, you can get 30% off your subscription if you go to ground.news slash Joe Scott. Yeah, ground news has kind of been the place that I've been going to just because, again, it's just seeing it in front of you, what the bias of the, the source is. It's... It's invaluable. I recommend it for everybody. Links down below. All right, big thanks to the answer files on Patreon and the channel members that are helping to keep the lights on around here, forming an awesome community and just being really awesome people. I've got some new members I need to shout out real quick. We've got Danny Wool, Aaron Hughes, Martha Fernandez, uh, Zach DeMillo, Robert Jean Rogers, Igor Savinov, whose name was in Cyrillic, but I translated it and that's what it came out as, uh, Deborah Kaufman, John Toll, and Chris Franzen. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them and get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and just be a part of an awesome community, just hit the join button right down below this video. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, uh, maybe check out this video. I'll, I'll share the metric time video, actually. I keep talking about it throughout the whole thing. It's worth watching. It's one of my favorites, honestly. Um, you can check that one out or any of the others that are on the sidebar if you're watching on your monitor. And uh, if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.